Okay. Do you think we may begin? Or okay. So hello again. Sorry for being a bit late. Well, bit. An Italian bit late. Mediterranean. Ah, Mediterranean bit late. Okay. So far, we have discussed of so-called pitchfork bifurcation, which is one the, the, the most common phenomenon of, of the most common phenomenon in static bifurcation of a branching bifurcation. We have seen. Let us suppose that the, the one of the paths is always, say, vertical, so no variation of the equilibrium state. We have Should seen... We right? Sorry? Q is, right? uh, Q is independent of the... Of the uh, Q is, uh, say, in a abstract space. Q is the descriptor of the state. So we are talking about statics, no, no, no complete phase space, only Q. And mu is a generic modulating control parameter. So just to distinguish it from the loading P, because it could, it could be confusing. But so we have seen uh, all example, examples in which in the perfect um, ideal case we have a trivial path no variation in the in the configuration and then we have uh, uh, we might have a symmetric behavior symmetric and it is usually said Symmetrical post critical stable even if it's not perfectly correct, not not, not uh, the spaces are correct. But say uh, let me an abuser notation in the sense that imperfect paths, imperfect structures have, don't see any bifurcation, but in any case, they have this kind of hardening behavior. So they have some kind of a, a reserve of stiffness. But we have seen there are also Symmetrical, unstable, post critical, unstable. Post critical, unstable. And we have seen that imperfect behavior is softening or better, even with a point of zero stiffness. And, sorry, at least uh, quickly, we have seen that there are also systems that are unsymmetrical and which can be like this, which means that they are non-symmetrical.
and what is important this is general sensitive or well sensitive to imperfection or better still imperfection sensitive in which sense in the sense that in symmetric stu structures starting from say a positive imperfection or a negative imperfection we see the same behavior there is no qualitative change so in this sense these two phenomena are imperfection insensitive while in the third one the quality or even the sign and the magnitude of the imperfection may affect, may dramatically affect the quality of bifurcation. Oh, there is, in the world of static bifurcation, this is not the only one which can happen, because another very, very, very interesting one uh, is a uh, kind of bifurcation which, sorry, might be modeled like this. Oh, well, I don't remember if. L stands for the uh -huh. where is it? Ah, okay. So this is L and L, or L over 2 and L over 2, it's immaterial. We start from an angle theta 0 or uh, theta is not. This is theta. And we provide a load, always a conservative load. Uh, this is a very mm, usual scheme in a structural mechanics and it is also of some applications in other um, branches of mechanics. It's uh, in uh, engineering mechanics, uh, as soon as you relax one of these Hinges, you have a ordinary um, engine combustion mechanism. So it is quite quite widespread. Sorry. Uh, so theta and also theta here should be for 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 the sake of simplicity. This is a an isosceles triangle. If I can, I will see if I can find something that uh, with which I can simulate this, but we'll see later. Uh, I don't want to enter the details, but in this case as well, uh, finding, uh, ah, of course, we are uh, 
we are admitting that uh, the load is conservative. So static things, no uh, particular effects. What is, what can be difficult here? Nothing special, but, ah, okay, sorry. These are not rigid bars anymore. I wrote, I, this, I drawn it with a thin line, so they are extensible. So we may see, we may write EA and EA. Or if, you, if we may prefer, we can say these are two linear elastic springs, kappa and kappa, K and K. If it is, what do you think, Urjan? Is it better K and K? EA is better. EA? EA. Okay. What have we got to do? A different shape is identified by the displacement of uh, the nodes. Let's give them some uh, Q, R, S. Q and S are fixed. R can be displaced not by rigid body motion now, but only by straining uh, the two bars, which are not rigid anymore. Uh, for the symmetry of geometric system of uh, geometric symmetry of the system, the point R goes up and down along the vertical and does not move horizontally. So a new configuration is given by the new position of R, which we may call R prime. And there are some te slight technicalities because, of course, in order to evaluate the new length QR prime, one has to do some, some trigonometry. For instance, this length is L. This is L tangent uh, uh, theta minus phi or alpha or uh, whatever you wish. So Pythagoras theorem gives you QR prime. So the elongation is QR minus QR prime. And QR is L over cosine theta. So there is uh, some, technical, some technicality, some, uh, some tricky things to do with uh, trigonometry, but nothing really special. So without going into details, which are at this stage immaterial, please follow uh, OK. Believe it or not, this is the energy, the potential energy. Which has to do, ah, L over 2, so maybe this is not, okay, it is not uh, 2L, but L, the whole, this is L. So this is L over 2 or L over 2. But I think it is really immaterial at this stage. But just to. So this is the elastic term, which is related to the square of the new, of the variation of length. And this is the 
So this is the work spent by the load, which is conservative and so on. OK, this is the potential energy, just to make things a bit easier. We turn everything into a non-dimensional form. So all these are now functions of numbers, of real numbers. OK, usual derivation. But now what we see is that if we, this is the, the derivative of the potential, of the total energy, uh, of the total potential energy. If we equate it to zero, in general, we have a non-trivial solution. That is, zero, theta equals zero, is not a solution. This is not theta and alpha, it's theta and theta zero, okay. But just like we saw in uh, imperfect uh, problems, the presence of this initial shape in some way destroys or destroys, okay. Does not provide does not admit zero as a unique, as a solution. So this is one solution. Which are parameterized by theta zero. So the, say in some way, the height of these two bars from the horizontal. So it is directly related, okay. Let us consider some, it is, some tricky things, it's okay, no need to reduce. So we see that in the previous examples we had a an equilibrium path which was trivial, which was which was a, a straight line. And which it meant that, which meant that you could vary the load as much as you wished, but there was nothing, no change. Since uh, our system now is, has no rigid parts, but it is, it is deformable right from the beginning, we cannot suppose that such solutions can exist. Solutions like the trivial ones in which no change in shape was present. I don't know if, if I explained the concept, but this is fundamental. And what do we see? Uh, let me see, maybe. Maybe it is necessary to. Oh. Why? Ah, okay. What a stupid. Is it readable? I think so. How can, how shall we read such a diagram? We start from a given initial angle. For instance, here, the red, the red curve.
which is one point, say, 1.2, which corresponds to 1.2 is 1.2 radians. I think it is 3 eighths, 3 pi over 8. Huh? 3 by 3, 9 over 8 is 1 point something. So let us begin from this, which is much, not much. 1.2 radians is almost more than 60 degrees. So it's, it's not this way. It's more like this. Hmm? We say that this shape is not shallow, while this is shallow. It has much, it is very important. It has much importance. But in any case, let us begin. Or maybe let us move to this one, the orange one, which is slightly. We start from here, zero load. Remember, on the vertical ax axis, there's the load, the control parameter. Now it is again the load. And on the horizontal axis, there is the change in shape. I, give it, I gave it for granted, but uh, from the point of view of the change of shape, the single displacement of the point R is enough. Because for symmetry, the system remains an isosceles triangle. Huh? The only difference is in the, its height, the height of the triangle. So we start from zero load. If we increase the load, what we expect to have, so we increase the load. What happens if we increase the load? This initial angle decreases. Is it true? Yes, because if we increase the load, we move this way along the, along the equilibrium path. We are moving this way. And in the beginning, the slope of the path, that is the global stiffness, so elastic stiffness and geometric contribution, is quite high. If we want to check this thing by an actual experiment, go to a tennis pitch, pick up an old ball, cut a dome from it, and rest it on a plane and press it on top. It will deform, but you, it will require a, a, <coughs> a strong initial force. Then something happens. Uh, stiffness, so the slope, begins to decrease and we reach a point of maximum. Mathematically, the system should go throughout the way. And in principle, it should go with zero angle and then go to the other side. It is normal. If I press here, and these are linear elastic, there will be a moment in which the two 
springs will be on the same line, then if I go on pressing, it should go the other side. I should go on pressing? No. When I go to the other side, what happens? When I overpass this point of maximum, what do I have? A kind of softening. So I can enlarge strain. OK, I can vary the deformation. But even when lowering force, And at a certain point, force shall become negative. So I have to pull instead of push. No. Uh, uh, these are not the inner forces of the. They are in compression, right? They are in compression as long as we are on this side. When you go to the other side, to keep them balanced, you have to change the sign of P. Because what do the spring tend to do? They want to retake their original length. And when, they, when you are on the other side, they tend to assume the reflected shape of this triangle. So if you want to keep them in equilibrium, you can't go on pushing them down. You have to keep them, keep them up. You have to pull. This is the meaning. This is the mathematical, uh, the, the physical meaning of this curve in which both the angle and the, f the outer force are changed. And then the curve is symmetric. And all those curves look the same. Fact is that actually no real system runs this path. Why? This is. A, I should have taken that with me. Uh, click clack effect, maybe uh, with a. With the closure of a Nutella bottle. You also have. Okay, never mind. Sorry? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. Fact is this one. Now I. Uh, I plot this here. So we have seen that, in principle, we start from here. We do like this. In principle, we should follow such a curve. Then it's symmetrical. OK, there are. Ah, of course, in principle, these are continuous. And we shouldn't, it is not necessary to load it in compression. We could load it with the opposite force. Mm -hmm. This curve always exists. What does it mean physically? This means that instead of doing like this, we should, we can pull it upwards. And of course, in order to increase this angle, we need a big force of traction. This slope is quite high. So it is very stiff. The, si the system is very stiff. What really happens is something which we have already seen, or maybe of which we have, or you might have already heard of. When we arrive here, point of maximum, which is the critical point, the system cannot follow naturally this path, but jumps. Uh, let us do it green. Q 
question is, is it physically possible? Yes, it is. Why is it physically possible? Because this is not a single valued curve. So that means that in principle, it is something similar to which we have already, no, sorry. Similar, but not the same. When we saw these diagrams, corresponding to the same level of load, there are one, two, three possible equilibrium. The perfect one, the imperfect symmetric to the right, the imperfect symmetric to the left. But even talking, even dealing with uh, only imperfect structures, there's the imperfect to the right and the imperfect to the left. And even talking of perfect structures, to this level of load, there are this equilibrium position, the equilibrium position, the straight equilibrium position, and this other equilibrium position. So we don't have to uh, be surprised by the fact that there are many equilibria corresponding to the same load. Fact is that, so this is the case, fact is that when we reach here, the system immediately jumps there, which is something which we might easily perform by an experiment. Just take this dome of a tennis ball or a, an iron thread. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, it and it snaps. It snaps. It passes almost instantly, but time is not doesn't matter because it's statics. But it jumps to a far different shape. So this is a qualitative change. So this is another kind of bifurcation, which is not a branching. This is the same. No, this is the same path. These are not two paths that cross. There is, al there is always a change in configuration. But in pitchfork, we could either follow the blue path, bar, rigid bar staying straight, or the, the green path. It buckles from to the left or to the right. So there is one path crossing the other, and there is a branching at the critical point, either here, here, and here. This is, so we have two paths. Here there is a single path. Remember, a path is a succession, a sequence of configurations parameterized by the controlling load or control parameter. So each of these points describes a different shape, a different configuration. Fact is that when you move smoothly along this path, you move between very near configuration, very near shapes. You give a, a gram of force more, a, a gram, a newton of force. You augment, you add, add a, a newton of force to the preceding one, and the system deforms, but remains next to the starting. Then you add another newton, the system 
goes on deforming, but it remains near the first deformed shape, and so on, and so on, and so on. But when you arrive here, even the slightest change in uh, the external load, so in the control parameter, doesn't move you to a near, the near uh, deformed shape, but transports you here, right at the opposite triangle. without almost no spent, expen, uh, expended work. When you arrive here, so let me show this load. This is jump or better snap. And, but if you snap to the other side, in order to keep the structure in equilibrium, you don't have to pull it anymore. You have, sorry, you don't have to push it anymore. You have to pull it. So you see, force, you must increase force, increasing force now means moving this way. you have to go to negative forces. Ah, of course, if you keep pushing, you will move. If you increase the load, you will go away. You have to decrease your pushing until you reach pulling. And when you arrive here, What does it happen? You switch here. No additional load, sorry. Yes. The, the area in which there should be a measure of energy. Yes, it is. What that's what I, that's what I was going to say. What about when jumping? Just one second. So when you jump from this red to the orange one, you jump between two quite different and then energetically, uh, to between two different energetical levels. Why? Urjan was saying that. This is, say, Q or theta, okay? So a generalized displacement. Here is P, generalized force. P times theta is a kind of measure of work. Are you asking for sure? Yes. So when you... move until here, say, you have done this work. Or proportional to, of course. Uh, work is not a force by an angle. Uh, there must be some, uh, uh, some details in, in it. But the displacement is directly related to theta. So this area is modulus some uh, 
modulo some uh, coefficient ratio, say, some uh, exchange ratio, it is equivalent or proportional to the work spent. So you spend some work, you spend some work and accumulate energy, both elastic and geometric. When you jump up to here, you don't have only this area. You have a lot more. But you didn't do any work. It is the system who moved to a very different level of energy. It is a kind of things like this. It is a thing like this. We are used to say that, you remember these, these funny pictures? What is this? Potential well. Hmm? And who tells you that there is just one well? Uh, well, in Turkish? Energy can be like this. Instead of being a, a second order and a function, can be a fourth order function. So what has really happened in that snapping? You begin here. You load, you, you, you give a perturbation, so you load. You move your weight here, 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 here. Okay, sorry. That is, if you move on the left, you will spend a lot of fatigue. And if you leave the load, it will return to the initial shape. So it is a stable part. If you go here, you will not see anything but a regular deformation. When you arrive here, a slight perturbation can either bring you here, so if you unload a bit, you go back here, but if you add some load, you go here, which is again an equilibrium, but very far from the first one. And in principle, these energy levels are quite different. This is of a lot of importance because it might be used for acting and for activating some electronic de devices, for instance. Or even, there was a colleague of mine who had uh, tried to study this uh, for uh, designing, uh, uh, what is it, shades for windows that according to the temperature go concave or co convex in order to reflex or refract uh, sunlight and so protect building from direct sun. Uh, or yes, yes, of course. Because this is only mathematical, of course, the system, in moving from here to here, it will do it by displacing with a certain velocity. We have no 
we have no time here, but actual transformation, it moves with a certain energy. So it acquires energy, which is the area here, which is not acquired by spending power, spending work from outside. It's the system, naturally. And goes to this other level. But these, these kind of laws are high, high static laws. So if you, you can make a, a series of cycles and the total area here is energy spent by the load, by the actual load, by keeping into account the, the two jumps but the energy spent is always positive, so this, this can be used also as, a, as the, uh, dampers, systems of dissipating energy. Fact is that, uh, of course, this might be used, so one can uh, think of uh, designing these things to be used. But one shall also think that if one does not want to have snapping, one has to know that there is this other kind of bifurcation, which is not Euler's column or buckling in compression. It is a different thing. And it is called fold. And in general, it's represented like this. Like a sheet of paper that is folded. And the most important, and it reaches a maximum, you see? The, the most important thing is qualitative. Because uh, when you have a branching, in principle, you you might think to have, uh, let us use two different colors. One point, one, remember, one point is an equilibrium, so a, a given configuration under a given load. Changing the load, you move along, you move the green, the green point along path number one. But there, it is also possible to have the second path. So by changing lo the load, you might have the blue point traveling along the second path. Okay? What does it happen? In a branching, the two points meet at the critical point, then again separate. One might go along two, one might go along one. Maybe the blue one can go along, uh, can change its path. But in any case, they will remain these two. This is qualitatively different. It is true that uh, at a given level of load, I might have a green point and a blue point. So there are two configurations under the same load. Either they go very far from each other or they approach to each other, coalesce, coincide in the critical point where snap occurs and then disappear. There is no continuation. It, there is no line here where the blue can continue and no line here where the green can continue. So it's dramatically different from a qualitative point of view. So static bifurcations are either pitchfork, pitchforks, static bifurcations, also called 
Bach, also called static instabilities, sorry, but better bifurcation, are either pitchforks or folds. And uh, when you talk about a fold, you, make, you may also introduce instability, uh, sorry, imperfections. Thing is that actually the, the sole thing, that the, the only thing that you might jump from one configuration to another one is already an enormous thing without needing to see if there is some kind of destruction. But in any case, uh, just so just to so we start from here, we load, we arrive at the, the threshold. Uh, analytical is all the same. Second derivative, when it is greater than zero, it is stable. So now the um, yellow region, the yellow, um, yes, say yellow, yellow region. Zero is yellow curve, which is the threshold. White, unstable region. So we load, or oh, better. Oh, well, this is not pleasant because the stable, stable region should go also here. Huh? Oh, sorry. What happened? Sorry. Let me, let me do that again. happened? Okay, you made a mess. is filling not to the axis but to the curve. Uh, two to one should be maybe. Let's see if it works. No. No, it's okay. I'll have to think about it. But let's say this yellow curve should uh, this yellow region is all below. Okay, but let's, let's concentrate on loading. We arrive at the, the limit, so the maximum of the curve, and we are on a stable, pla stable path. We are inside the region of stability. When we arrive at the threshold, a perturbation may either take the system back in the stability region or bring it into the unstable region. Of course, if the system is unstable there, it will not stay there. And you see, all these branch, all this piece of the curve is in the white region, is unstable. So the system will not stay there in a natural way. It will jump. It will go from here directly here. And that's it.
now this is this is not interesting. So we have seen static bifurcation. There are dynamic bifurcations. Are they so different? Yes, they are different because we have always imagined things only in terms of, say, displacements, so variation of configuration. When we deal with dynamics, we have to consider the phase space. So a state of the system is not only its position, but its position and its velocity. Of course, in a general sense, this is plotted in a, in a two-dimensional space, so we have only one uh, degree of freedom and one degree of uh, virtual velocity, but of course, you, one should imagine that in a very general multidimensional space. Uh, what is the fact? Whether in either way we consider this, we consider this, we arrive at an equation of this kind. either by direct equilibrium or by Lagrange equation, Euler-Lagrange equation. We know that when we, uh, we perform Euler-Lagrange equations, I have such things. Uh -huh. Where is it? Here. want to check if yes okay it's better with my with plus well this is if an active force is concerned otherwise if I want to uh, consider free motion this is zero what's the key of it the key of it is I will not enter the details, I will not do many diagrams, I will not do many equations. I will give, here I will give really only concepts. Let us say that we have, well, either if you have a given function here, so let's, these are vectors, these are matrices, is it usual to do like this? Okay. Mass matrix, damping matrix, stiffness matrix. In either way, you uh, obtain this either right from the scratch or by discretizing a continuum model. In order to solve this equation, you have to first to solve the homogeneous equation and then to add a particular solid situation, solution, pardon. Uh, but when, in the most simple cases, these matrices do not depend on Q, so constant properties of the system, sorry, systems, uh, properties of the system that do not depend on the shape, on the configuration, and on the velocity, and on the acceleration. Hmm? Well, for mass, this is quite usual, unless you have really a rocket with, uh, that loses mass as, as long as it goes into the atmosphere. Uh, systems do keep their mass. Uh, 
damping unless you change some substance inside and stiffness. What is the idea? If, if you write this here, the solution must be like this. Hey, what happens? Derivatives, time derivatives look like the function itself. So must not be other than this. What do we have then? We have this. Of course, this second part is never zero. Ah, sorry. Lambda is, in general, complex. Because uh, this shell, all in general, represent a motion. So if this is a complex, you, we know that this is, this has a real part and a complex part, or better still, E uh, A to the A plus I B is what? Nurjan, tell me. Cosa. <laughs> it is A I, A to the e to the a times cosine b plus i sin, sin b. These are Euler's formula. And this is the harmonic part. And we can't get rid of harmonic parts because in principle solutions of these equations might have harmonic parts or better still, are composed, are largely composed of uh, superposition of harmonic parts. So in general, we'll have to suppose that this lambda is a complex number. And indeed, since this part, since this is a scalar different from zero, well, a vector the A is a list, so is a vector, but this E to the, to the lambda T is a scalar which is different from zero, and A are in general non-zero, because otherwise there is no solution. So we shall solve something which looks like an eigenvalue problem. We or better, a generalized eigenvalue problem. Hmm? That is, the mathematician would say, we are looking for the eigenspace, for the kernel of this differential operator. Is it too much? Do you do linear algebra? You know what, what the kernel of an operator is? The eigenspace. Eigenvalues and eigenvectors. The kernel of an operator is its eigenspace. The number, the, the, the set of all vectors which have zero as an image which are transformed into zero, which is this. What are the eigenvalues 
of this linear differential equation. It is not a linear algebraic equation, but it is linear. So it has a in a uh, vector space which is infinitely dim dimensional because they are the, the unknown are functions and not numbers, not lists of functions and not lists of numbers. So they are finite lists, but each term in the list is not a scalar but a function. One is used to say that we are moving in, in inf infinite dimensional spaces, but they are linear spaces. So they have the same structure as ordinary vectors. So such operators have eigenvalues, generalized eigenvalues, generalized eigenvectors, which are sets not of numbers, sets of functions, which are the functions which are transformed into zero. Sorry. Null vector. Hmm? So in general we have, say, this is a biquadratic, sorry, a quadratic equation. We have two, well, two times n. If we have n degrees of freedom, we have two times n. But for any, let's, let's just to give idea, let's consider only one degree of freedom. It's not a problem. There are two solutions for this. Lambda has two solutions. In complex field, two solutions can be real, Complex conjugate, oh, real different, real coincident, complex conjugate. If they are real, they can be plus and minus. They can, they are plus and minus. It's the if you have to solve this equation. One of the cases, well, one of the root is with plus, the other one is with minus. So the solution is a, the solution, this one here, is a combination of uh, e to the, uh, say, plus beta t, a1 plus a2, ma e to the minus beta t. This is decreasing, so what does it mean, the effect of a perturbation vanishes? This is increase with time because beta is real and positive. We have said if we, we have two uh, real roots, should be opposite, plus beta and minus beta. Now we are, we are, we are uh, so one, only one degree of freedom. Only one degree of freedom in general. Sorry, uh, well, I, make, I made some confusion. Let's begin, let us again, let's not make any particular thing. Let's keep it general. We might have real and distinct. Uh, real coincident, uh, some of them coincident. Uh, 
some real and some uh, complex. If there are, the fact is, if there are complex solutions, they shall be complex conjugate. This is, this is it. The fact is, uh, if we have complex conjugate solutions, uh, these represent harmonic motions. Whenever I have e to the ib, I have cosine plus a sine, so something harmonic. But if they are complex conjugate, I have plus and minus. So I might have combination of, say, let's give an example. Uh, of, I should say it with more simple words. Okay. The purely imaginary part makes it a, an oscillating part because here I should, I should think that this is lambda and I have to multiply it by t. So if I say cosine bt plus i sine, sine bt, this is oscillating. Just imagine it that b is omega. It is an oscillating thing. But it is pre-multiplied by e to the a. If a, the real part of this root, is positive, we have something like this. an oscillating part which is modulated by an external part that increases e to the a, which is positive. Otherwise, it is just the opposite. It decreases. In general, this means that sorry, no, it's just the opposite. In and In general, if I, have, if I plot here the real part of the eigenvalue and the imaginary part of the eigenvalue, we might have things like this. Why always in couple? Because if we have imaginary roots, those shall be complex conjugate. If they are purely imaginary, they are like this. But they can, they can have, they can be here. Or they can be here. What is the difference between these situations? When the real part of the root of the eigenvalue vanishes, there is only the imaginary part. So this pre-multiplying term here, e to 0 is 1. So we have only an oscillating, only an oscillation, which we, if there is no damping, will continue forever. Oh, but if, if there is damping, it will slowly, quickly decrease and the system will return to equilibrium. But even in the absence of damping, remaining on the same circular orbit, say, does not change qualitatively the behavior. So this is a stable situation. When the real part 
like the green balls, the green points. When the real part of the eigenvalue is negative, the system behaves like this. Because the pre-multiplying part is e to the minus something. Oh, by the time, sorry. Let's make it like this. Alpha plus I omega. So, if the system is characterized by physical properties and a control parameter somewhere here, a control parameter is hidden. Where? I don't know. It might be in the mass. It might be in the damping, it might be in the stiffness. Why, uh, we So it was in the stiffness before, not in the elastic stiffness. It was in the geometric part of the stiffness. Somewhere there can be a control parameter. What happens? By turning, by tuning the control parameter, these eigenvalues, the solution, the path can be here or it can move here. So any couple of, po of symmetric points here denote a behavior like this, stable. But as soon as we move to the real, uh, to a couple of uh, eigenvalues with real positive part, then we are here. And the system oscillates with growing amplitude. We have flutter, this is what we call flutter. And, of course, this is all, all these equations are linear. Linear elasticity, linear damping, nothing is linear. Nothing is really linear unless we keep all things very small compared with other. So, when we have uh, sit situations like this, this one here that I have just, okay, framed in yellow. This is quite dangerous, quite unstable. So it is usual to say that in a dynamic system, one shall measure the path of the eigen dial eigenvalues as modulated by the control parameter. It is not necessary to check all the configurations because there, are, there is not a definite configuration. There is a, an, evolu a, an evolution of configuration, but which are always of this form. So checking their Stability is checking how lambda is, how lambda transforms via the control parameter. Galloping is something similar. I will not enter into details, but this is the key principle, the key conceptual principle. When you, the change between, okay, in real, to tell the truth, also static 
buckling can be considered. And uh, in this way, because it is possible to imagine eigenvalues also for static problem. It is a bit more fancy, but it but believe me like this, it is like this. And uh, the mathematicians would tell you that this is called divergence. It is, it is not uh, the mathematical operator. It is this phenomenon is called divergence. And you have uh, uh, purple. You have points which are initially here, then collide. or just the opposite. No, 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 I didn't want to do that. Ah, what are this? Much easier to do like this. Okay. Most part of the introduction is finished. I can only if you think it is, that might be a thousand, zillions of things to be said, but the concepts are this. The only thing I can do is, as maybe I told you, derive the equations of uh, buckling for an Euler column by a variational approach. But this is very technical. I, uh, that's okay to me. Yes, I think so. What time is it? Only one hour. I took, no, 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 don't, don't say that. <laughs> Never say that. No, I, I mean, if, if you think uh, that it is, I'm here. Ah, maybe some hints. No, 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 this is no, this is necessary. We talked about. We always talked about uh, um, distinct eigenvalues. Hmm? So this means that there are uh, always in the complex field there are bullets that are symmetric with respect to the real axis. But there might be real, only real, uh, so I will draw them again. There can be an eigen, a real eigenvalue here, another real eigenvalue here. But these can coincide. For some value, this can coincide. So instead of having two distinct points, this might collapse into a single point. Uh, this seems only mathematics, but it is actually not. Uh, Let us just imagine, uh, you know that Euler's column I'm shifting from discrete to continuum, but this is The eigenvalue is uh, 
this is false. This is false because this is, or better, this is not precise because one should say if I am in the x y plane then this is Young's modulus times the moment of inertia about z the third axis hmm? here there is a cross section and its principal axis of inertia are parallel to y and parallel to z. So bending occurs about an axis which is not x, is not y, it is z, it is an out of the plane axis. And if I am to evaluate this moment of inertia, I have to evaluate the moment of inertia of this cross section with respect to z. What about three dimensional problems? Do we have, re in, in general, real plane problems? No, oh, in general, we have three dimensional problems. So, in reality, we have this is a, the critical load with respect to the z axis, but then we have a critical load with respect to y axis, which has a similar form, but so actually the real critical load, the first one, is attained for the lower of the two ones, as it is usually said, the, uh, the beam buckles in the plane of less inertia, of lesser inertia, or the less stiff plane, as you, as you prefer, softer plane. Oh. Well, oh, in some way, these are two distinct eigenvalues. In the general theory, I had just uh, Skip, uh, sketched these two values, these, these two numbers are two distinct eigenvalues, which in this case are both on the on the right side of the real axis, but it's not a problem. But we perfectly know that, for instance, if the cross section is like this. its moments of inertia are exactly the same. And uh, so these two values are exactly the same. So the two eigenvalues coincide. So the two buckling modes, the two uh, qualitatively different shapes which are different, say, the two shapes which are qualitatively different from the initial one which denote the occurring of buckling coincide. So what's, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that then you don't know where it goes to, to buckle and more important, you don't know if imperfections or higher order effects, because we stopped things to the first order, we made a linear analysis. We don't know if these are enough. And 
just just think that if we made a linear analysis here we wouldn't have seen anything a linear analysis here would have told you that the system would behave like this straight line the tangent to the curve at the initial point you wouldn't see anything here so there are some effects which are discovered only by an exact or at least a higher order investigation and uh, fact is that there might be instances which are qualitatively easily to explain just imagine and these are quite important both in structural and in both in structural mechanics and in engineering mechanics just imagine a very simple example this is a truss so let's keep it in the structural engineering just to make it uh, static and no no dynamic effects very very easy no redundancy let's imagine that we are in some way compressing it so what does it what happens if the truss is sufficiently long and I examine it from far say the, the truss is nothing more nothing less than a beam and in with it under compression and it, it will buckle under Euler, Euler's uh, critical load but let us imagine that one of those beams for instance one of those bars for instance th this one has a different stiffness some defects some crack or different material might it happen yes it can so this is all the rest are EI and this is mu EI with mu control parameter oh sorry so let's make it this is mu this is lambda or another thing lambda was the eigenvalue I don't want to make uh, let's make it mu and nu no, confi no Poisson's coefficient two numbers two, two control parameters what can it happen since both lines the top and the bottom ones are compressed this yellow bar can undergo buckling by compression at a different level as the global one and this global and this local buckling can be modulated by the oh, let me see how it says no. This is mu. This is nu. So there is uh, this one. 
well, it's more or less in between. Okay. In general, there can be, of course, then there are paths. Of course, I can vary mu independent of nu and the set. There are combinations of mu and nu that uh, determine a local buckling and the combinations of mu and nu that imply a global buckling. So there are some combination of mu and nu for which the whole truss buckles like a single beam. There are combinations of mu and nu in which the truss remains straight but the single yellow bar buckles. So this is local. This is global. Maybe I should have used two different covers. Yes, yellow like local. Green, okay, like global. But what happens is that physically the system will not follow both, but it is quite likely, and you can think why, it will follow this. So for certain combinations of the two, it will follow the local mode. For other combination, it will follow the global one. And uh, how can I discover this? Oh, well, this is not possible only on uh, uh, only keeping account simple linearized equations. I have to resort to some nonlinear expressions because otherwise I miss something. Is this important? Yes, it is important to, for instance, in trusses, but it is important also in thin walled profiles. Why? Because when you subjected to compression, it can buckle as a single beam or one of its parts can buckle as a single separate strip local buckling versus global buckling. And if they coincide, that might be a mess. So there is a lot to be studied. Also with the optimization processes, of course. Because one would think that, well, I may make local and global critical load coincide and I would get uh, good things. Uh, it's not, it's not that easy because if for some, for some reason, just imagine that these two curves, instead of being like this, just imagine that these two cur curves were dif some slightly different, like this. Oh, a green one. Are we sure we want to risk to enter by slight perturbation of the parameters into this softening branch? Who says that? So every time there are so-called coincident modes or better, coincident eigenvalues or double eigenvalues, uh, coincident uh, modes of buckling, 
there might be it might be necessary to be to pay more attention to investigation and design that was either too much for for the audience not for me you have any question yes please No linear? Non-linear Of course. Uh, of course, because... Non-linear system is also instable? No. But non-linear... Such things as this is trivially linear. Yes. But can be instable? It can be instable for some particular arrangement of these parameters in spite of being linear, in in spite of being linear. non-linear uh, terms for instance I can have non-linearities yeah. in damping what for instance no. you have to perform an analysis like this and in principle you don't have exact answers because you in principle if such equations of motions are non-linear you can't have this general solution. Nonlinearity does not issue in stability, am I right? In general, no. Okay. It, it might even be, uh, it might be uh, even a be sfruttare, uh, used to reach stability. Nonlinear dampers for uh, dynamic, uh, for seismic isolation bridges or operating, operating rotating machines. Fact is, this yellow frame here is the solution only if the system is linear. If the system, so if it is a solution only of this other frame if this other yellow frame. If this system is non-linear, because, for instance, damping is non-linear, then either one has powerful in analytical and numerical instruments to follow the solution, but in general it is a real mess because you don't have a general way of solving the problems unless unless these equations are redu uh, re reducible to very uh, limited set of known ones. Uh, hope, uh, no. Mathieu's equation or uh, uh, what is the other one? The uh, okay, there are a series, uh, a series of uh, equations of motion, or of non-linear equations of motions of which one has some hints on the general solution. But in general, we don't have general solution. In general, for non-linear systems, we don't have general solutions, apart from special cases. So the fact is, one usually performs a series expansion. So it says, this is, I have a nonlinear equation. I approximate nonlinearities. I expand nonlinearities into series. The first term provides me with a linear approximation, and I may use this one, this theory. In case I have, I use uh, the second order expansion, which is a linearization of the first order, which so I can simply turn the wheel again. These are, these are, this is the key of static perturbation or... Oh, yes, I don't, I don't remember exactly the words, but... Uh, 
multiple scales, they call it, or uh, successive perturbations. When you say so, it seems quite easy, but it is not. Why? Because when you have a linear system, a homogeneous linear system like this one, then uh, uh, you know that it, it has at least the zero, the homogeneous, the zero solution, and you're searching non-trivial ones. When you investigate higher order terms, you have left uh, right hand sides that depend on the first order solution but when you so you have a second order system which is actually a linearization around the first order solution so it is again a linear problem but with a non homogeneous right hand side and you perfectly know that when you have a linear algebraic system with a non-homogeneous right hand side, you do, you're not sure that a solution exists. You have to ensure that a solution exists and you have to uh, force the so-called compatibility conditions, which are a bit heavy, but okay, they can be solved numerically, but in principle, you have to solve the problem, to make the problem solvable, then you have to check whether the solvable problem has additional solutions, and if it changes the stability of first order of one. So, in principle, it is simply a turning of a wheel. In practice, it is not. In practice, you have to fight with a lot of numerics. Oh, well, why numerics? Because in general, uh, analytical solution exists only for a very, 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 very limited set of examples. The simple supported bean, for instance. Or, uh, oh well, there are not so that many instances. Let, al let alone when we go to shells or cylinders or plates. Of course, the system is much more complicated r right from the beginning. But in principle, the concepts are the same. You can have static bifurcation. Bifurcation is either static or dynamic. When you ha deal with static bifurcation, you can simply look for a variation of the total potential energy and then you have either a pitchfork or a fold. Uh, only thing you have to check if in that case you might have uh, coincident modes, coincidence, I, uh, I get critical values, critical loads. Uh, when you have dynamic, you have to check the so-called poles, the, where the eigenvalues are placed in the real and imaginary plane, and make them move by turning the control parameter. This couple, these couplets, this pair of uh, eigenvalues will move in the real and uh, imaginary plane, in the complex plane. If uh, the real part stays in the left hand, so with a negative, negative real part, the system will remain stable. When it crosses the imaginary axis, so the real part becomes uh, positive, then at least one part of the solution goes far away from, from that ball that I drew to this morning, and the system goes crazy, instable. Was that enough? No, it's, it's a pleasure, never mind. Okay, many thanks. We can finish here. Yes, please.